Mick Hawkes, QCB, unveiling the secrets of covert operations, self-defense, and security. In this riveting episode, I welcome Mick Hawkes, a former British 2-2 SAS operator, to discuss his military experiences and the transition to his current mission of enhancing rural security. This episode offers a deep dive into the complexities of covert operations, the mindset required for high-stakes missions, and actionable advice for improving security in the agricultural sector. This episode highlights Mick's dedication to leveraging his military expertise to enhance community safety. So Michael Hawkes, QCB, stands for Queen's Commendation for Bravery, an honour he received for his covert operations in Northern Ireland. This prestigious award was given for his exceptional service during his undercover work. He elaborates on the nature of this work, emphasising the complexities and dangers involved in such missions. Mick reflects on the challenges faced during operations, highlighting the importance of situation awareness and self-protection. He spoke about his time in Northern Ireland, illustrating the skills he developed that are now applicable to his current work. He notes that during his covert operations, he often had to blend into rural environments, which has given him unique insights into the vulnerabilities of farms and rural properties. After leaving the military, Mick found himself living on a farm in a posh area, which sparked his interest in the agricultural industry. Initially focused on personal safety and situational and awareness training, he soon recognised a significant gap in security culture within the farming community. Farmers are often easy targets for criminals due to a lack of security measures and awareness. To address this issue, Mick has developed a series of courses aimed at agricultural colleges, focusing on rural situation awareness and farm security. He believes that by teaching young farmers about the tactics used by criminals, they can better protect themselves and their properties. Captured in Bosnia, a lesson in composure, the incident. The conversation shifts to a specific incident during Mick's time in Bosnia, where he and a colleague, the famous or infamous Billy Billingham, were captured. Mick recounts the experience, noting that while they were detained, they maintained a level of composure that allowed them to gather intelligence on their captors. He describes how Billy, who attempted to communicate in Serbo-Croat, was repeatedly dragged into questioning, while Mick chose a different tactic for his success. He shares that this mentality of resilience and calmness in the face of adversity is something that he has passed on to his children, who are also in the military. Active shooter training, practical advice, run, hide, fight. Mick explains their approach to active shooter training, which inv involves teaching everyone in a company, from the CEO to the janitor, about their options in a crisis. He outlines the three primary responses, run, hide, fight. While running and hiding are prefer preferable, he stresses that sometimes fighting back is necessary. He cites examples from real-life situations, such as the Bondi stabbing incident, where individuals who chose to confront the attacker had a better chance of survival. Mick shares a story about a company in America that sought his advice on security measures. He identified safe havens where employees could hide during an active suitor situation. By marking these locations with clear signage, he aimed to reduce panic and provide a straightforward solution. Military experiences. We talked about the differences between various special forces units, specifically comparing the SAS to Delta Force. Mick shares his experiences working with Delta, and to find out more, you'll have to listen to the end. You can find Mick at the show links below, just click on those. If you're listening here, hawksandco.uk, that's H-A-W-K-E-S and co.uk, on LinkedIn, Click the show notes below. And on Insta, Instagram.com mhawks40. Again, click the show notes below. Thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former New Zealand Special Forces Operator, subject matter expert from HowNotToDieGuy.com. And you're listening to my Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast, sponsored by State, the ultimate daily formula for optimum hormone health, stress management, energy, and performance. 100% natural and clinically proven ingredients. Provides everything you need to raise your game in a convenient gut-friendly capsule. And my new sponsor, Michael Mason of the Mason Survival Protocol. Links for my former shows are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.
And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle Podcast. Welcome to my guest, another former 2-2 SAS operator, Mick Hawks. Thank you so much for ta- taking the time to come on. Uh, pleasure. And uh, thanks for the thanks for the invite, especially down under. Yeah, gosh. Yeah. So I'm from New Zealand. I'm living in Australia. And all these people contacted me from all around the world saying, you got to go get this guy, Mick Hawks, on. Uh, there was all different people. And uh, so I reached out and sometimes people ask me, how do you get these guys on your show? And it was just so nice to just be able to reach out to you, Mick, and a bit of back and forth, and bang, we got you on a couple weeks later. Yeah, I think I think what it is, is because we come from that sort of community where we all like to help each other. Uh, so when people reach out, it's uh, it's always a pleasure, really, to to help and, uh, and to chat as well, because we all like to reminisce on uh, on the stuff that we used to do. So, yeah, my, my pleasure. Now, I've got a straight-up question for you. I don't normally have um, a prepared question, but this one's super easy for you, and I, I don't know. It's, you know, um, th- your title is Michael Hawke's QCB. What's QCB? Uh, it's Queen's Accommodation for Bravery. Uh, and what it, it, It's a sort of lower-down uh, award uh, that I got uh, for covert operations in Northern Ireland, so really long hair. Uh, my nickname used to be Jesus. <laughs> uh, or or Custer, tell tell Custer to get his hair cut. Uh, but I uh, I did uh, a lot of uh, covert operations in Northern Ireland, and and one specific operation uh, meant uh, hiding away for thirty six hours uh, in the most uncomfortable and antisocial place you can ever think about being. Um, but it it sort of finished with uh, the capture uh, of uh, uh, some high profile terrorists in Northern Ireland. Oh wow! Thank you for for elaborating on that. Um, I know the guys in NZSAS in um, A Squad, and they trained us for. I was on the counter terrorist team, um, for New Zealand SAS. Um, as, as that's our only role. We had green roll um, badge guys, and we had us that was brought in two thousand five just to do the CT to take the pressure off them. But um, the A Squadron guys, they um, they were in Afghanistan the year earlier, and uh, Willie Apiada uh, won a um a VC. Uh, for an operation there but the guys uh, you know th- they'll get the awards but they can't be uh, actually read publicly we got them back in the unit and the history room and so on um, sounds really intriguing what you did in Northern Ireland I- I've only read the books I mean this is quite interesting now Rusty Furman the reason the guys in black the reason that I, I got into special forces and now I'm-, I'm talking to a guy that I've read the books on 14 into Northern Ireland and uh, the female operator that was there with the, the book out and so on um, what can you speak about regarding the operation where you, you actually got that award? Is it, is it one of the ones that's been published or is it private? No, no, it, it's fairly private. Um, but most of the, most of the operations that, that go on over there, especially using special forces are, are quite, uh, quite sort of kept in the house. Uh, mm. but, uh, a lot of it, it, the way, the way the SES sort of work and, and do that, um, we we have a troop over there, or we used to have a troop over there permanently who were the reactive uh, part of it. Um, and uh, and instead of waiting for, because it's, a, it's a, quite a small cell, uh, so uh, some of us used to volunteer uh, to do the deck course, or 14 in, as they called it. Yeah. And uh, and they run they run two six month courses a year. Um, and uh, and what the regiment try and do. Uh, because it's a very good skill to have, uh, you know, doing uh, covert surveillance and that. But uh, each squadron um, gets asked to put a single individual. Uh, and to be honest, it's not the, a, a lot of people don't like doing it or volunteering because ultimately when you come from 2-2 and you go on a deck course, you're putting yourself on a bit of a pedestal right. um, to be knocked off. <laughs> uh, so, so you've got to go on there with the right mindset. And they, the mindset that I was advised and, and a very good friend of mine said to me, Mick, when you go on there, button it uh, and just, you know, it's their toy. Um, so just just go with the flow. Um, and he, he was spot on. So uh, you just got through it. You, you used to do CQB, uh, close quarter battle, which is our bread and butter. Uh, so nobody from a regiment ever fails CQB. Uh, CTR, close target recce which again for regiment guys is is very uh, bread and butter. So uh, very rarely does somebody fail that. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and then the, the obvious main skill is surveillance. Uh, now we've had a few people fail that. And the reason being is uh, it's not everybody's uh, bread and butter. Uh, yeah. and, and we normally find that operators 
uh, regiment guys uh, are very <laughs> aggressive uh, in their nature. Uh, so trying to try to be covert behind a uh, hardened criminal uh, in a in a staunch um, terrorist location. Uh, they they can stand out somewhat, you know, because of the RoboCop mentality. <laughs> <laughs> Where they go. So, so it, it, it's not everybody's uh, bread and butter. So we have had a few people bail uh, surveillance, uh, understandably. Um, but the, the, the other two is, is a bit, bit of a no-no. However, uh, we did have a guy uh, who failed CTR, not just once, but twice. Um, and the reason being... He didn't button his. Uh, he didn't button his mouth. So yeah. went on there with the wrong attitude. Yeah. Um. Tried to try to tell them uh, how, how we do it in the regiment, which is a big no no. Uh. You know, it's it's there, and 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 ultimately, what you do is the aim of the game is to get through the the six month course, which is which is a great course. You know, I've got a lot of respect uh, for some of the debt people, fourteen yeah. men. Yeah. Uh, but then at the end of it, you do you then do an eighteen month. Uh, uh, tour uh, in Northern Ireland, and I was lucky that I went to a small debt. Uh, there's there's uh, four debts altogether, um, and I went to a small debt that was uh, officially province wide, uh, so it wasn't allocated a specific city or area, uh, but we were province wide. But um, it was a bit unreal because we had North Belfast um, and inroads into West Belfast, and that wow. really uh, took our took our attention because we were working against not only Catholic uh, terrorists, uh, we did a lot of work against Protestant terrorists as well. Wow, that's some um, that's some work. 18 months. That's, you know, when New Zealand Special Forces op operations are normally three months, they're super short. A regular force operation normally six months. I know the Yanks do something different, but 18 months to hone your skills in an operational environment, it's really clever doing six months training and then you're in the in the fire, in the frying pan there for 18 months. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a minimum requirement, to be honest, because you the first month that you get over there is a thing called orientation. Um, and it's where they allow you to, to grow your hair long, beards and all that lot. Because you have to, they have to take you into areas that you officially are not allowed in, um, just so that you know where they are. Uh, so that you you understand the ground, you know what where to walk, where not to walk, um, and you can only find that out by actually getting on the ground and and doing a you know proper orientation, uh, if that makes sense. And, and, and at the end of that uh, at the end of that month, what you do is you you burn all the clothing you you've got you you've worn uh, because you uh, you obviously get noticed massively by everybody. Yeah, it's been quite strange. Uh, you then change your hairstyle. Um, and uh, shave off your facial facial hair, or whatever. So you you look completely different when you actually start doing the uh, doing the job. And I think the the eighteen month is is really a minimum requirement to, to get to know the area, uh, and to, and to, but also get to know your targets as well uh, and their and their routine, uh, if that makes sense. But but it, it's it's quite a complex, and it, it used to be very complex because you you there's two sides of the. The, the equation there, the Catholics and the Protestants, uh, and we don't take sides. If you're a bad person and you're carrying a gun, regardless of your religion, you're going to get it, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, you know, there's no there's no bias towards the IRA, um, you know, when you've got the, the UFF or the UDF or whatever, the Ulster yep. Freedom Fighters and yep. the Defence Force, you know, the, the Protestant side of it. Uh, they, they were doing some bad stuff as well, uh, if that makes sense. So they obviously the focus was more on the uh, the IRA. Um, one thing I did notice uh, in that 18 month uh, uh, was was how nice the Catholic population were uh, <laughs> because there was when I first joined the military I, I did a, a, a four and a half month tour in South Amar um, yeah. which uh, and it, again very Catholic orientated down that end across the Glen. Um, uh, you know, Newton Hamilton, Besbrook, all them types of area, very, very uh, predominantly Catholic. Uh, so the impression you get is that the Catholics were bad people. <laughs> so every, you know, typical military humour, I suppose, but every Sunday you took great delight in stopping the Catholic population going to church uh, by searching all their cars. Oh, Unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, if I may, just, just, you know, because they were Catholics, so they must be bad people. 
But when you think that 98% of the Catholics in Northern Ireland are really, really good people, uh, nothing to do with the uh, the terrorism side of it. Uh, and I and I didn't really pick up on that until um, we started doing the undercover stuff uh, and spending time over there and getting to know get to know the the real people. And and as it transpired, I found Belfast even in the in the day. Um, one of the most sociable cities you can actually go to, uh, especially in the city centre, um, you know, because every, everybody comes together. It's a, it's a bit of a, and it's funny, you know, having a, a drink of beer uh, and across the pub uh, is one of the guys that you were following the week before. <laughs> wow. Uh, fact, so, it, yeah, no, it's a, it's, a bit, it's a bit surreal, but very enjoyable. You know, for the listeners, it's, uh, it's a different era. Uh, before we started recording, we talked about Rusty Furman, you know, uh, with the uh, Iran embassy uh, siege just being the era before you, and then you're coming on. The era of people now probably wouldn't understand what Northern Ireland's like. You've, you've said a bunch of, of town names, but, you know, taking out of that, you were surrounded by terrorists, give it, give or take religion or, or where they come from. You're surrounded by terrorists, and to paint a picture for the listeners and the viewers, this is a place where if you drive by once... And you come back the second time, the second time might mean you're going to get ambushed and killed. It's that dangerous. So, and these guys are all European. It's not like Afghanistan, Yemen, all these wild places. It's the, It was the Wild West back then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And uh, and uh, again, to put it in perspective, I, I spent two years doing MI5 in London as a military observer or advisor. Uh, totally different. In, in Belfast... Uh, your third party awareness uh, of what you're doing needs to be absolutely spot on because not only can you get yourself killed, uh, which is the last thing you want to do, but actually your the, the way you go about your business could actually get one of your op, uh, oppos killed as well uh, because they they may go, you, you might not be on the, the serial the following day, uh, but you, you've actually come to the attention of people in that estate uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, one of the other operators goes in there, gets pinged uh, because of actually what you did. So every time, every time we uh, come in off the ground, uh, so if you do um, on average a four, five, six hours uh, surveillance serial, you'll come back in and you do a big debrief, and it, and it's you've got to be really honest, yeah, um, and, and own up to the fact now. Unfortunately, being you know typical SES, my surveillance skills weren't best. Right. Um, I, I was very, very so I used to get blown quite a lot. And what we mean by that is, you know, people used to ping me uh, as being a bit, you know, not not from around here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I I spent a lot of my time in the helicopter, um, much to the delight of everybody else, because the 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 worst part of uh, doing a serial when you're following bad people is being in the helicopter because there's there's nothing you can do about it apart from have your high eye uh, in a sight, uh, looking and following the target and everything else. Uh, and if anything happens, uh, you're up there and the boys are on the ground, like you know. So, uh, so I found that. Um, uh, not, uh, I think a lot of it is your attitude as well. I I I had a very robust attitude to following people, so I used to like uh, getting stuck in. Uh, because you, you, I knew I was only going to be there for eighteen months, and the yeah. the chances of, of um, you know confronting a terrorist was, was you know uh, that's what your job's all about, like you know. So every time they wanted to walk past of you know an area, uh, and the, just a matter of interest, there was a uh, uh, the IRA were putting a mortar together in a house uh, in the Ardoin, uh, and the Ardoin for for people that don't understand is, is uh, very tight area to operate in you know back streets and alleyways and stuff like that and uh and we were on an operation to we we knew that they were putting a mortar together but we didn't actually know the exact house the number yeah. and it was about two o'clock in the morning um and they said listen we, we need to walk past so you know i was out the car and gone before anyone yeah. could answer yeah um, and and we the normal military uh were actually told to keep out out of bounds but you know what the Green Army's like. You know, if you tell a Green Army guy you're not allowed in there, Nosy. guess where they're going to go? No, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, and I and I looked a bit suspicious anyway because I had really long hair. Um, I, I looked like a, every time I used to come back to UK, I used to get stopped by the customs and immigration because <laughs> I looked like a drug smuggler. 
you know, long blonde hair, big gold earring and oh my life. Uh, a disappointment on their face when you used to pull your ID card out like you know. So we, we were doing this operation, um pinged, um, because you could hear them talking and putting the so we, we got the exact number of the house that they were doing this in. Perfect. Literally about 20 metres further on, a, a military patrol, British Army patrol, coming the opposite way. Oh. Um, and, uh, here we go. So what we tend to do, because you've got your pistol down your front of your trousers, uh, covertly, a couple of magazines in your pocket, if they were to frisk you really quickly, uh, it, it would cause a, a bit of a nose, a uh, bit of a drama, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so really what you do is you hand them your driving license uh, straight away. And on the inside of the driving license is a little note just to say, listen, I'm in the British Army. Um, I've got uh, a pistol on me. Treat me like you would do anybody else. And it, and it was a young, must have been about 18, 18 years old, young young kid, really, in the patrol. Yeah. Pinged me, threw me against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, managed to, I managed to, you know, have a look at that. Um, and and to be honest, he was perfect. Give me a bit of a hard time, you know. Obviously, felt the weapon, uh, yeah. and but did, didn't make a drama out of it. Uh, didn't make a lot too much noise. Just just sort of roughly up so that if people were watching, uh, yeah. they would you know give me a. And then the, and then they let me on the way, uh, and they sort of went. They they actually went past the, you know, where the IRA were putting the thing, but they didn't know about that. Uh, and literally a couple of days later, um, I was on another operation. So, so they didn't actually, they could have, but they didn't blow the operation. Yeah. Um, and they could have. Uh, so um, a couple of days later, I was in an army camp, uh, just having a cup of tea. Uh, and, and this young lad walked past and he sort of <laughs> recognized me. And, it, and he came over and the first thing he said was, well, you know, you lot are brave. And I went, actually... It's you lot that are brave because the, the, the IRA know who you are um, and you're actually walking targets. I said, for the IRA, they don't know, they, they haven't got a clue who I am. So the people that are brave are actually you lot. And he was chuffed a bit, like, you know. But his sergeant major was was walking, was was sort of heading over. I think it was going to give me a bit of a bollocking because my <laughs> hair was long. Um, and, I, and I explained to him that, you know, the incident that had happened. And I said, listen, you, you need to give that young lad a bit of a pat on the back uh, because he, he could quite easily have blown that operation. But uh, using common sense, uh, he uh, he managed to get it done like, you know. So so uh, hopefully, I'd like to think that he got a pat on the back uh, for, for doing what he did. Young young lad. I'm yeah. just annoyed that the army, the army were in there in the first place. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> not allowed in there, but hey, you know, army's army. I've got a, I've got a, a story that I'd like to run past you if you've heard it or if you think it's real. It's a it's a bit of a maybe an urban legend about a two two SS guys, and then we're going to go on to a, a bit of what you're doing now related to your covert work and experience. Um, so I heard there was a couple of uh, SA two two SAS guys on a Green Army course, and for the listeners, that means they're going to their normal army base. They're wearing their uh, their sand berets and, and wing dagger, but no name tags and. In the regular army have got everything on the name tags, everything ironed, and I believe they uh, they're walking past this uh, this officer, this Rupert, and uh, they don't salute because you know we don't salute in, in the unit, and uh, he, he gives them a hard time. You know what are you not what are you doing not saluting all this stuff? No name tags, and one of these um, these troopers he says, "Listen, do you know who we are?" And he goes, "No." And he goes, "Good, well fuck off then," and they carry on their way. It's uh, it sounds about right, mate. To be honest, you know, I've, I've been on courses. Uh, I was on a motorbike course actually, um, and because normally you wear civic clothing, uh, well, on the motorbike course we have to go in in uniform, uh, and because with the sandy berry, so they they put us all in the sergeant's mess. Uh, but I I went up to the RSM uh, and introduced myself and said, listen, there's five of us here uh, from Hereford. We're on the on the course. I'd just like to introduce myself and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, we uh, we tend not to do what the normal Green Army do. Uh, <laughs> and and he was fantastic about it and, uh, and fully accepted it. And I think if you, if these two lads had have probably done that in the first place, um, it wouldn't have caused, uh, uh, caused a drama. 
but the the some of the Green Army, and again, you put yourself on a bit of a pedestal when you mm. when you mix with the Green Army, um, and you you always get the odd one, and it's typical Rupert's as you mentioned there, uh, that just want to make a bit of a drama out of some uh, by by pulling people up, but quite rightly so. The uh, the person that is pulled up is probably quite a lot of experience about him. You know, he may be a trooper, but he's probably a sergeant back in the parachute regiment or the Royal Marines or whatever. Um, and uh, and quite rightly, they'll they'll pull the Rupert up for, for for trying a big time. Exactly. I'm glad you talked about experience, um, Mick, because I'd like to touch on and focus on a bit of what you're doing now. They're gonna I'm gonna surround that with some of your military uh, adventures as well. But you know, you you've entered into a um a, a business with your your daughter Keely. Uh, focus on. I saw your mission was was brilliant. You had. Uh, you know, we're on a mission to make the streets a safer place for young people, which I love on the website. But the other part of it was rural crime. And, you know, you spent, you were literally a trained professional in breaking into places, particularly the rural places. Can you just elaborate more on what your mission is there in relation to rural crime? And I believe we've even got some stuff in the background you've got there. What's your mission focus there and how are you helping people? Yeah, so I, I I actually live on a farm, uh, on the posh part of the farm. So the working part of the farm is across the road. I'm, I'm in the posh part beyond the, beyond the big mansion, uh, if that makes sense. So um, literally when I came back, and, and there was no intention to get into the rural industry. Uh, it was all about me and Keely doing the personal safety situation awareness training. Yep. But then I realised, I thought, actually, um, bear in mind that in 2-2, two two, we used to break into farms uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, not only to ascertain, you know, where things were, uh, so it had to be covert. So you you knew, you know, uh, you were a better class of villain, if that makes sense, because <laughs> you were doing everything, uh, you were doing every, everything covert. But we also do, you know, the, the hard arrest sort of thing as well. So you'd be on uh, in a farm, dug in, uh, hiding away, literally as farmers are walking past you and, you know, and everything else uh, wow. on the farm itself. So so you, you knew you knew how to... How to operate on a farm, and I thought taking that, um, I, I started to read that how how much criminality uh, in the rural industry is is really blighting uh, the, the the industry over here and, and probably worldwide really, um, because farms are easy targets. They, there is no security culture uh, within the farm industry. So on that basis, I thought we we can now, uh, and it's the old poacher term, gatekeeper. We we can help the farm industry here. Not by doing what all the other security companies do, by going in there, security assessment, saying, right, you need this, you need that. This is going to, it's going to cost you this amount of money, exactly. which is the normal stuff. Um, but it's actually trying to change the security culture uh, of the farmers themselves by going into the agricultural colleges where the youngster, youngsters, uh, young farmers start their career. Yep. Uh, because bit like the military when we first joined the military we've got no security awareness about us yeah. but within about six months we're, we're pretty switched on and, and 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 we we then continue that for the rest of our life um so if we can if we can do the same to the farm industry uh by by teaching them uh you know how to be a bit more switched on how criminals operate um we what we've done is we've devised a set of courses uh, that we want to, to give to an agricultural college, and it's uh, rural situation awareness, farm Brilliant. security, how criminals operate. Uh, because if you can understand how the criminals operate, you can better able to deal with it, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, confrontation. Um, so uh, we're about to go down on the 7th of June. We're going to give a big presentation about culture uh, to rural crime units, um, police, um, yeah. And members of parliament um, down in uh, down in Wiltshire because we got invited down there because they they understood um, that what we offer is actually the weak link of all the security because the regional crime units can only do so much, CCTV technical can only do so much, and it's all really down to what the farmers do. And if they don't play their bit, then then all that other stuff doesn't work. So on that. Um, we're just what we're trying to do, and we understand that farmers don't have a lot of money. Uh, yeah. So getting it into getting this into the the industry from the uh, from the off really, but because what I was trying to explain to people is 
CCTV, expensive CCTV and monitoring devices and all that sort of stuff is totally wasted. Uh, if the people that are operating it are not are not security uh, orientated, it's just a waste of money. Plus, also the criminals they're not they're not put off by CCTV because uh, it never used to put us off. When we used to, you know even dogs never used to put us off. You know we yeah. deal with the dogs um, covertly, deal with the dogs. <laughs> um, but we you know because you, you just drug them, uh, you know put them to, put them to sleep for a couple of hours while you are carrying on your business like that. Um, they used to love drug meat for some reason, but hey. <laughs> uh, so um, it it what what you know what we're trying to say is um, don't spend your money on all that stuff. You know, spend it on your farmers, spend it on your people, uh, because all your farm workers are actually walking CCTV units. Yeah. But only only if they know what they're looking for, uh, if, if that makes sense. So, um, and it and it's not a massive outlay in money, really. Um, it, just trying to change the culture. So what 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 basically what we're trying to do is t- something totally different. And and people are now trying trying to they, they've identified that. That's why we've been invited down there uh, to give a presentation. We just need the industry uh, to to realise that we're here to help, not to uh, not to rip you off. Um, you know, like a security company would do. Um, we're, we're literally just trying to, and it's the same as what me and my daughter do. Uh, with the youngsters and everything else, it, it's about helping people. Yeah, bro, uh, there's that is amazing about helping people. I've interviewed and, and I interview, you know, not just um, veterans and 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 uh, sometimes serving military guys. It's a straight to a minor muscle podcast. You got scientists, you got um, uh, politicians, the best people in the world at what they do, doctors, and, and a few SF veterans, and every one of them, including the sergeant major of the army who was our RSM at the unit. They all say they're to, they're to help people, Mick. So to hear that from you, and I know you're probably not listening to any of the shows, it's just what we do now. I think somehow, for some reason, we we enjoy paying it forward. But to be fair, I mean, you won the the, the QCM, uh, QCB, sorry, um, for serving for serving. Now people don't realize what that that word or that term actually means. Yes, you're in the service of others, either the Queen or or your, your regiment or your your troop or whatever it is. But you're serving, and and we just carry it on as we go into the civilian, where we're there to help others. Yeah, I think I think it's in our nature, uh, especially at the operator stage. You know where you know you've let you've done that that normal green army stuff, and you get to a certain level, but you're now um, you know doing the operator stuff, and uh, and I think it it focuses your mind a bit more uh, about helping the general public because uh, what I was trying to point out was. The reason 2-2 SAS is, is good and, and also other SAS units are good is our diversity uh, mm. of how we can fit into any environment. Um, and, um, and just as an example, so um, I was on the anti-terrorist team, so Black Kit, one minute, over in Northern Ireland, long hair, Jesus, uh, next minute, dragged back from there straight over to Bosnia, green army kit and, and this and the other. And and you tend to you tend to just go with the flow, um, and it's the same that now that we're out, um, right? How can we right kiddies? Kid, um, you see it on the streets, you know, kiddies get in all sorts of trouble. Knife crime over here is rife. Mm. Um, so if we've got the experience to to help, then why shouldn't we do it? You know, we we should be. We just need people that, and it's the people that that can make a real difference to these kiddies' life. We need them. To understand that we're here to help uh, and and get it done because we we've done quite a few schools uh, recently teachers um, corporate industries uh, and everything else like you know but it, it's all about helping people to make sure that the bad people are not the winners. I I love you said that not the winners. I, I say the first rule of self defence is there's no rules as long as you're safe and as long as you win. I want the the good guys to beat the bad guys and to win, not just try and survive, but to win. <laughs> and you're so right because. We've got the skills, and the skills are out there from so many people that we know and and that we don't know that we would know of. Um, but it's the exposure of it. So when you're saying you're going down uh, next week, you got the um, the the police there, you got MPs. They're going to get that word out, that word of mouth, which is brilliant. <laughs> but as you're saying, what you're doing, I couldn't get out of my mind. Sorry, Mac, I couldn't get out of my mind. Clarkson, Jeremy Clarkson, faffing around on his farm, and and maybe you coming in there and having having a word and having a teaching moment as well. 
it's funny because I, 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 I've just done an interview with someone else before it, and he said, have you, have you thought about Jeremy? I actually sent a, a message to Jeremy Clarkson with the words of, me and you would be really good together. With your sense of humour <laughs> and my sense of humour, yeah. we would make a great team. So I, I, I needed to watch this podcast, uh, if that makes sense, because he, he ignored me and he never replied. Uh, <laughs> but but for, you know, for exposure, you know, some of, working with some like Jeremy Clarkson and, and, you know, talking about the security side, it may be just what we need uh, for people to understand, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to do. And, and the other thing that, with Keeney, what, the reason I use Keeney, my daughter, uh, is, I, you know, the three boys in the military. So she's of the same ilk. And she actually walked up uh, Ben Nevis at the age of seven. Really? Uh, seven great. years old? Yeah, seven years of age, mate, all the way up Ben Nevis. Uh, wow. And I've, I've seen I've seen Squaddy's jack on that and, <laughs> you know, walk back down. So uh, so she's quite, uh, yeah. She she she's got something about her. Uh, it's a proud dad. So, it's a proud dad moment right there. Yeah, absolutely. So she she's actually taught by a guy called Ginge Johnson uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and a couple of other people, uh, if that makes sense. A guy called Alan White uh, who um, likes to hurt people <laughs> <laughs> for a living. Um, but she so she's taught by quality quality people. Yeah, uh, and then taking what they teach her, she then adapts that. So when, when she's teaching school kids, it's all about breakaway and an exit, an exit yep. strategy, you know, yep. because that, that's that's the important thing. When she's teaching adults um, and the breakaway doesn't work. <laughs> you break them. How, how, to, yeah, how to revert to plan B. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you obviously you, can, you can't teach that to kiddies, otherwise you create monsters, uh, if that makes sense. But yeah. for adults, it, it's always handy. But they, the kiddies and, and females especially, they relate to Keely uh, more than me uh, because I, I do the scary bit as to why they need to be more switched on and this, yeah. that, and the other. But when it comes to the physical breakaway and also the restraint training, uh, we've just done 35 teachers in Aldershot um, last week. Um, when, when we do that side of it, they, they relate to her because she's a female doing it uh, yeah. rather than you know this big strapping, horrible... SES, XSES guideline, you know, so so the, the the dynamic works really well, father and daughter uh, works really well, and and that's what we're trying to develop, because it is unique, uh, it's different, you know, I don't know anyone else that uses a, a daughter to to do what we do, um, and, uh, and I, I, you know, and it, it, to be honest, it's just good having having my daughter there, because she, she is of the same boys, uh, but she, she works with my ex-wife, um, amicably divorced, so yeah. you know, so I can go in her shop and she's not going to throw coffee at me. <laughs> uh, but uh, she works with my ex-wife uh, Kim uh, in in a shop in Hereford. Um, but I just think there's a bit too, uh, a bit more to Keeley than serving coffee or juices and stuff like that to people. Uh, so we we try and get Keeley involved in in the training as much as possible. I'm I'm sure that. Um the the communication there of a male and female um and a different age different ages as well um because i'm learning so much i learned it with police i learned it with um uh through what i'm doing with the fire brigade but just different people it's about message sent and message received you got to put that message out but if someone's not receiving it maybe it's, there's another way around it another way around it and and you're very clever having both both sexes there make um because you will get people that just switch off they just glaze over the women that um just there's some trauma there with a male for sure. Um, and they just, for some reason, even though they're paid to go to that course or that class, the, the message just isn't getting through. And to have both those sides of communication is, is brilliant. You know, um, so we, we talked up at the, at the CS camp um, and it was the uh, the wives that, that go to school. And, and you know what it's like. Kids don't listen to death. <laughs> so you, you would have thought, you know, SAS they'd know straight away like that but but no one li listened to the dad so they brought brought us in to to do the teaching um and it was great having kiddie there because a lot of the questions uh that it is were what keely went through when she was at school uh yeah. so she was able to yeah. uh answer the questions straight away so not having her there would have been quite difficult uh if that makes sense so yeah it, it's it's a great dynamic uh and and uh and really I, I mean, I can see Keeney in a couple of years' time 
going off and doing her, her own training. Uh, if that makes sense, she doesn't need she won't need the old man with her. You know, she can just go. It'd be great, you know, because it's um, and and this Hawks and Co is all about bringing the bringing the kids into it. Um, it started off with me and Keely. Uh, my youngest son's a military dog trainer. Uh, he's about to leave the military. Uh, so it'd be nice if he can come in and help out. And he helped us out really uh, when we did the older shot and the uh, the kiddies because we did the kids first at older shot because it's yep. learning difficulty uh, children wow. uh, who are not allowed in mainstream. Yeah. So, uh, but on the streets they're very vulnerable. Uh, mm, very. very but but vulnerable on the streets. So uh, we taught them the personal safety situation awareness training. Ironically, just before we got called in by the head mistress, uh, and she sat us down and said, "Listen, you know, it's going to be very difficult teaching these kiddies uh, because they can be very disruptive. You could say something which may trigger them, blah blah blah." And my answer was, "If you can teach an SAS squadron, you can teach anyone." <laughs> <laughs> oh well, see. And, and it went right about. The kiddies were great, mate. Honestly, you know, yeah, they, you know, some of them were walking out and disruptive and that, but generally, um, uh, they were good kids and and they loved it. When when it comes to the physical side of it, doing the breakaway stuff, um, they they really come to the fore. Even some of the ones that were very reserved and quiet, um, once they you know they could get up and we were giving them a bit of confidence. Because when I teach kids, I dress like this, uh, sweat yeah. top, um. Because kids don't really, uh, they don't relate to authority. Uh, so we try and make it as, as chilled out and relaxed as possible. Funny story, we were in Gloucester uh, teaching a whole school. Uh, so we did five one-hour sessions for each year. Uh, and at Gloucester, uh, if you're a rugby fan, uh, Gloucester yep. is a hardcore yep. little, little city, rugby city. Now, me and my daughter are staunch Leicester Tiger fans. <laughs> uh, and, and it just happened to be the season that we absolutely hammered Gloucester home and away. So the <laughs> second time, now all these kids, uh, th this school, St. Peter's School in Gloucester, provide a lot uh, of internationals and, and Gloucester players come from, because this school, very, very disciplined and they play rugby. So the second slide that we put up there, <laughs> was a big Leicester Tiger badge uh, a reminder of the score. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, just to break the ice, if that makes sense. And the, the only bad thing was well, the teachers were very strict with the kiddies, which which didn't go down too well with me uh, because they, they're a bit on edge and they're, they're unlikely to put their hand up and ask a question. And, and, you know, we prefer the, you know, relaxed, chilled out, you know, don't feel, uh, you know, intimidated by asking a question. Exactly. Uh, but it was great. That's brilliant. It's it's um, I, I enjoy the puzzle of being a dad and working out the the kids, but I also enjoy the puzzle of of teaching. Um, when when I was teaching as as an operator, I I would um, our guys would go through the pistol training, the the young younger guys coming through, and of course you got the bell curve. You have got the guys that are no good at this end, the majority of them, and the guys that are amazing. Um, but the ones that weren't doing so good, the pistol is very hard to um to master. Um, I'd pull them aside and, and I'd be the softly, softly approach with them, take them away from the, the mainstream sort of um instruction. So I enjoyed that. But funny, um uh a bunch of people I, I trained with self-defense last year um was elderly people. And I, I love that you mentioned you've got learning disability people because elderly people, learning disability people, uh kids, they're actually the prey that the bad guys go for. People think out there, we're going to train the BJJ guys and all these athletic people. I'm not bothered by that. I want to teach the, the these people are 60 to 84 years old, Nick. And for the first, it was I did the same thing as you did two. Uh, I did four one hour um, lessons over four weeks. First lesson was you know getting to know each other, getting an idea. The second lesson, they still weren't quite um, switched on to protecting themselves. They're like really not bothered and not haven't haven't got that killer instinct. And so I thought to myself, right, how do I get this? And I bought some teddy bears along because they don't want to protect the, the, you know, um, the valuables and things. But I said, I threw them all the teddy bears. And I said, right, this is your grandkid. Now let's go. And you saw them protect them straight away. So it just took the puzzle trying to figure out what's the what's the trigger there to switch these people on to to be able to to learn this the right way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because nobody is the same. It's the same as classes. Uh, you, you, and it's all about, and, and we, we get taught it all the time, know your audience. Yeah. Know what you can get away with uh, and, and what you can really push. Uh, if that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah, it's good for us, you know, teaching 10-year-old kids private girls' school in London. <laughs> and uh, bizarre. We rang, We got to the main gate, me and Keely, rang the head teacher up, and she said, yeah, just come through the main gate, Mick, and uh, and follow the drive for two miles. <laughs> no. We were like, Hell, yeah. And, and sort of, yeah, typical, typical girls' private school. But it was great, you know. Yeah. Hey, stuff you know they were you you couldn't stop them giggling and oh my life uh, you know, <laughs> ten year old kid but it is you know, and bros and, and and we always point out you know because we never ever allow people to take notes uh, and the reason being is if they're taking notes they're not actually to what you're trying to trying to tell them so we we just send the presentation to the teacher so that they can they can sort of read it in slow time yeah of course and uh and, and you know and but it but it for us it, it it's good because they you know, if they just remember one little item um, and it keeps them safe, uh, then we, we've achieved the end because uh, that's what it's all about is is for, for people to, you know, first and foremost, avoid the trouble. Keep the keep way out, way out of it, especially with people with knives and that lot, you know, don't don't get engage, get away from it. And only as a last resort uh, and you feel that you need to, uh, then you, you just go full in. Uh, if, if that makes sense, it does. With the with the, uh, with, with the idea of making sure that you know your exit strategy, that's always your your primary aim. If that makes sense, and yeah, it's 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 going well. We just need more people to to understand what we're trying to do. It's interesting you say understand because that's clearly what you do with the farm stuff. And I'll just tie a bow in that for the listeners. You know, you've got your own farm. You you've you you that was your job was breaking into them and, and getting around all the things that are in there. But you saw the. It sounds like from what you've you're saying is you've seen the gap there. The the owners themselves they don't want to spend money, um, and they don't want to spend extra money, and they don't then that they're, they're going to spend a ton of money on insurance. They do get robbed, and if they do get robbed, they're going to lose profit because they can't use that piece of machinery or whatever it else it is that these people are nicking. Even worse if they're nicking um, livestock or other things. But very clever, I think, there. And I think it's it's a great thing you're doing because there's the margins in farming over there are so small. The government really makes it hard on you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I feel for the farmers in a way because a lot of them are, are in isolated locations. Uh, mm. and the um, that, So the presentation we're giving down and what they've asked us to take out of is our confrontation side of it, how to deal with confrontation. Mm. Uh, because we like type uh, scenarios of dealing with confrontation whereas the police will always say lock yourself in your house and bring the police well that's great in theory in reality no policeman's going to turn up like you know what's the, the, and, there's and a there's it, a there's a saying isn't there when um, when seconds count police are minutes away and i was a cop for a couple of years here <laughs> no I, I, you know, and that's why when we do the our uh, <laughs> our uh, when we teach the the niche stuff like the um, active knifeman or uh, terrorist thing, we always go against police advice uh, and police guidelines. And the reason we do that uh, is all the all the police training, uh, or and they call it the maraudering here. Um, when you read their guidelines, it's all about having a police response at the end of it. No. Um, you know, as well as I do, look at Christchurch. Um, everything's going to be done and dusted before the police even turn up. So we need people that are hardy, uh, understand what the threat is, um, to be able to deal with some uh, before the police turn up. So when we teach active shooter, um, Rather than the police, what the police do again they, is they nominate individuals with certain roles, uh, roles in an active shooter situation, mm -hmm. which I find quite bizarre, uh, mm. to be honest. Because what if that guy, what if that guy goes down? What if there's, what if he's a, you just can't fill the gaps? Yeah, absolutely, and and you know as well as I do that nobody knows how you're going to react to you know someone sticking a gun in your face until it actually happens, uh, and uh, and as you know, the classic one was it's great having a plan, 
<laughs> until someone gives you a good punch in the face. Yeah, exactly. Or in this case, when you when you you know the back of your head gets blown off, like you know, uh, yeah. and your plan goes out the window. So we we teach everybody in the company. So the cleaner to the CEO all yeah. sit down, um, and we go through um, what you know your options here. You know your options are always to to run away, get away if you can, hide if you if you can't get away, then to hide obviously. Uh, but but it's this third one that that we have a lot of contention with, yeah. and we go with the American, which is fine, um, because yeah. ultimately um, you have to do some. And and again, I use Christchurch uh, as a, as a great training tool uh, about the need to do something, because if you do nothing. Unfortunately, you're just going to get uh, well, put under the ground six feet. I, I, uh, I think now, I think now, Mickey, you could probably use Bondi um, four weeks ago as a training tool going on from that. So, I mean, I've written articles. I wrote an article for Software Magazine on the the France playground stabbing. Now, that was not many people, um, which is sad. any any life lost for us is is the biggest deal. Yeah, our job was to rescue the hostages, but um, Bondi was pretty interesting. You know, a lone guy with a knife in a mall. So it's in literally on a Sunday shopping or whatever day it was. And there's a lot of people dead. But the people that did fight, um, there was a guy who got a bollard. You know, he's never trained to the bollard. He just chose to fight. Another guy turned to confront him. So he's, you know, air quotes for the listeners, uh, fighting. Um, once you are in that situation and there's no other option, you do have to fight because the ones that ran... A lot of them, uh, they, they didn't survive. Um, and that's a great example of, of multiple people trying to fight back that pushed that guy away from them. Yeah, absolutely. If you know the options before, and that's why we always say, you know, if, if you train, if, you, if you've got the knowledge, um, first and foremost, it's easier to make a response. Uh, yeah. Because if you know nothing about uh, there's a good chance that you're going to you're going to pick the wrong option, and the wrong option is going to get you killed. Um, you know, we when the, we we started this training really after the Paris attacks uh, in 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 Paris, uh, 2015. Yes. Uh, and because I I was head of security for a company, and we were based in in um, I was in Monaco actually. Um, so a lot of our people came from came from uh, France and everything else and yeah and we found that um you know gunshots in a in a in an urban environment uh tend to not be so when you're looking for the gunman you tend to not realize where the gunman is uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a bit like a you know speeding police car as soon as you hear the siren everybody's wondering where the hell <laughs> <laughs> where the, where's that police car because because of all the different noise and stuff like that so so a lot of people were actually their instinct was to run instantly, um, and actually they they were running towards where the gunmen were. Uh, if, if, so if, if people are aware, if, if you know, do a bit of training, and and that's what we're a big advocate uh, for these major companies, um, especially people that send people to higher risk locations. You know, just do a bit of training with, uh, and give them a bit of a, you know, forewarned is forearmed, as they say. Uh, it is. It is. I, I was, I was teaching the, teaching these oldies the other day. I call them oldies with absolute respect because I said to each and every one of them, they've got more experience than I have. But all we're trying to give you is a file that you can access that you didn't know about before. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that, and that, we're trying to get that across to major um, that, um, you know, if something happens, your people need to understand what their options are. Mm. Um, and and these are the options, and they're, and they're, they're really quite basic. And and what what the other thing we do is we, you know, when we're walking around a building. And bear in mind that eighteen months ago we got asked to go to America, um, where oh, active wow. shooter is. They're they're way on the top of their game, but they actually wanted a Brit to go over there, <laughs> uh, just for a bit, a bit of common sense, really, because this this company were on the seventh floor of a multi multi story building. Yeah, seventh floor. Yeah. Um, and their instant option was right. We need ballistic doors. <laughs> we need ballistic doors here. Blah blah. You know, and we're like that. Hold on, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that ballistic door rubbish. You know, the chances of something happening like that on this floor pretty remote. So that let's use a bit of common sense here. So we just identified, um, and it was all the toilets. All the toilets had inward opening doors. Yeah. And no, no windows. So a perfect place to hide. Uh, if that makes sense, if you're going to use a, a door chock, uh, so chock the door, 
uh, at the bottom so exactly. that they can't force a door in. Um, you know, so we, we identified and we put a big yellow sticker in the top left-hand corner so that in your blind panic when someone's shooting, uh, you run past a door, see, uh, you know that, that that's been identified as, uh, as a safe haven. Uh, so it, it, really it was all about, you know, lowering the vision. Uh, really, uh, of of what active shooter is all about, and uh, and coming up with common sense solutions as opposed to typical American, you know, <laughs> ballistic door everywhere. You know, <laughs> do this. Everyone, but, everyone be armed. Uh, yeah, ex- it's just ridiculous. Exactly. That gives me a great um segue. I've only got two two sort of um ideas to cover off with you to finish off. Um, but the the next one. I've had uh, different operators from different units. I had uh, SSR, uh, Delta, SEALs, SEAL Team 6, all that stuff. Thought I'd ask an, an older school lad from 2-2, who was better in your day, Delta or uh, or 2 SAS? Oh, 2 SAS every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> now, the re- now, now, bear in mind that I uh, I did a, a, a bit of a trip with Delta uh, over in, uh, they, they wanted to learn Arctic Warfare. Yep. So previous flew flew to Fort Bragg uh, with uh, one of the squadrons, um, and uh, and they said, "Yeah, can you teach us Arctic warfare?" We said, "Yeah, no problem at all." Expecting to be flown to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> um, the coldest it got was about minus one. No. Um, and uh, anyway, yes. And we uh, our our recommendation was don't bother. <laughs> if, if you know, if to learn Arctic warfare, you need to be in the Arctic uh, for for real uh, and stuff like that. So, but really good lad. I really enjoyed working with the Delta Force lads. Um, but they the the reason I think T two are slightly all the other tier one units is that diversity. You you can you, literally you can grab a squadron boy, um, and they're not the biggest of guys. You know, we're, we're all pretty slim and. Uh, because you've got to be with a burger on your back, you can't, you know, can't afford to. We have got some big lads, um, but the majority are quite small and, and wiry, stuff like that. But you can grab that individual and chuck him in any environment on his own and say, make it work. He just roof it with him uh, and he'll, he'll, he'll make it work. You know what I mean? And I think that diversity of the individual just puts him slightly above. SF units, uh, and that's not me being pissed. Uh, that's on experience, having been through different environments and having to change uh, and adapt pretty quickly. Uh, if if that makes sense, it does. It does. And coming to Australia and uh, and and knowing uh, SASR guys and Commando guys that from the Two Commando Regiment here, and seeing how big it is. And New Zealand SAS is so small. If somebody says they were in, or they know somebody that was says he's in, we know everybody. I can go and look at the photos of of the regiment and see the squadron photos in the in the regiment. It was it was a group back then, New Zealand SAS group due to the size, um, and it's a small unit. And those guys were just brilliant, uh, so diverse because uh, we had a small military. There was in my in my um, group for for counter terrorist uh, role, we had um. Uh, Willie Arpeda, Arpeda was one of the boss. He was one of our group commanders. And then there was an Air Force guy next to me, another Air Force guy. So he was a, an Air Force tech, an Air Force mechanic, and me who was uh, ex infantry, and, and Willie who who was a, a badge guy. Very diverse. There was a Navy guy. There was t- there was a, a Passer uh, a Navy guy, and there was a, a techie Navy guy, and just diverse as hell. And, and like you said, little big, um, really interesting. So I think probably New Zealand SS has got a real tight arm. Um, uh, uh, relationship with with two two. Yeah, absolutely. We we have got a, a bit of a, an affiliation with the New Zealand uh, guys, purely because a lot of them come over to Hereford uh, and do the and uh, do the course. So so a lot of Kiwis. My very first trip from B Squadron was to New Zealand uh, to work with the uh, with the guys down. Uh, we attempted to climb Mount Cook and failed miserably. It's a tough uh, mountain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not not the nicest mountain to climb uh, at all, um, but it it was great. Um, and some for some bizarre reason, uh, someone suggested a rugby match. Who the hell goes to New Zealand and takes on the 
the dessert rugby, and we got absolutely battered, uh, <laughs> beaten and battered, if that makes sense. Um, and, and anyway, you know, when you're black and blue and stuff like that, uh, you know, the question is, why the hell did we play much soccer? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. We might have won the game, but yeah, uh, not 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 the best idea. Let, let's take the let's take these lads on at rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're talking about that diversity. Oh, yeah, you're talking about the diversity in in uh, in the regiment, and Billy Billingham is is very famous for uh, his quote on a couple of shows. You know, when he first got his first squadron, he was like, "What the hell have I got in for? One guy smoking over here. There's a big fat laird over here, and so on." And uh, I won't steal his thunder. Go go watch a show if you're listening to it. But you've got an amazing story about Billy Billingham and and you in Bosnia. I thought it'd be a great note to end on. I've somehow managed to sandwich the show together, the right things in the middle, the introduction at the start, and, and a good note to finish on. So I listened to your story uh, last week for a bit of research. You and Billy Billingham in, in Bosnia, and um, and you, you've you've managed to get yourself in, in the shit a little bit. Can you can you tell us what sort of happened there? Yeah, it's... Um, so bear in mind that I've just done all the covert stuff in Northern Ireland, so I missed all the build-up. Uh, and Billy and... Three of the other guys were already out uh, in Boston, so I joined them late. Um, Billy had been on uh, all, all the all the build up, so he learned a bit of servo crap, and you know, and I, and I just turned up. Now, you know, I've been in the regiment um, about four years before Billy, so I've got out there. Um, but I also understood um, how to go through an interrogation, if that makes sense, because uh, <laughs> a lot of that was on the Northern Ireland training. So when um, we 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 had to set up a meeting um, and. It, it wasn't a big fancy, you know. It was just a general from the Muslims and a general from the uh, from the Serbian army uh, in no man's land, uh, and it was it was a UN based sort of meeting. Uh, so we went there. We we don't look like UN, um, although we were part of the UN. Uh, we didn't dress like UN. We didn't we didn't do what the UN did because otherwise, if we did, you wouldn't be able to operate. Yeah. Um, so. Just an example, we never used to wear ballistic helmets or body armor uh, because we just we used to dress like they do on the front line. When you're dealing with frontline troops, uh, to get to get their respect, uh, you you turn up and dress the same as them. Uh, if that makes sense, wrong, you know, typical UN sort of stuff. So all that went out the window, and people understood that. So um, when we set this meeting up the day before, me and gone down there to to do a recce. Uh, but also to have a quick chat with the frontline troops, the Serbs. Uh, had a coffee, slip of a uh, couple of drinks, and staggered <laughs> back. Um, and then, uh, and then set the meeting up the following day. Um, and uh, me and Billy decided to to go, you know, because because you get bored because the UN were leading the the meeting, uh, and the UN could be really sure. So we let them get on with it. So two lads stayed with the meeting. Me and Billy decided to to you know go for a little walk about. Um, so you can imagine. So we were thinking that these people would recognise, mm. but not realising that um, because the general was in town, uh, that their frontline troops were slightly different, were more professional. Um, and we 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 had an inkling as we were walking towards that they looked different. So when we got there, we uh, you know we we looked like a bag of crap to be honest. You know, vigils <laughs> and. Uh, and all we had was pistols, our personal pistols, uh, and uh, and unfortunately, they uh, about eight or nine of them jumped out with with the, their their sort of variant of an AK forty seven. Uh, so you, know, you can't really fight your way out with pistols uh, when when they're carrying out. So uh, you know, bang to rights, really fair dues. Took us into a house uh, at the checkpoint there. Um, quick interrogation, really. You know, who are you? Blah blah blah. Um, and we didn't want to let on that we were, you know, we couldn't, we can't let on that you're SAS because uh, two months previously in Srebrenica, um, the SAS were were bringing in uh, ground attack Serbian positions. Uh, so the SAS had, had a bit of a bad reputation uh, for the Serbs, uh, if that makes sense. So we, we, we couldn't let, uh, you know, allude to the fact that we were, we were regiment. We were UN, slightly different, blah, blah, blah. So they drove us 45 minutes. Uh, they they realised interrogators a bit more. So they drove us 45 minutes down the 
um, they put me and Billy in the back, um, and the uh, big burly guy was in the passenger seat, um, and the major who, uh, as it transpired, was going to be the interrogation. He he was the uh, he was the one that was driving, uh, yeah. spoke perfect. And we didn't know about that uh, until we got further on. So Billy were in the back, and we were we were just you know whispering to each other, you know, saying that you know everything's going to be cool, you know, no dramas here. Um, and then the guy that was sat on the front seat spun round, uh, you know, because obviously they they wanted to make a big drama out of stopping these two from talking, and he cocked his uh, in our faces, and and I don't know what it was, maybe nerves, but me and Billy started laughing because the first thing that went through my mind was how come he's cocking his weapon? Surely, if you're on the front line, you should have a you should have your weapon cocked. So military humor so that didn't go down too well at all <laughs> so, uh, so we we literally got to the camp and it was quite a famous camp because uh, there was a lot of um muslims that used to be taken there and that's all these people were in the in the courtyard looking poor to be honest so they dragged us in put us into a, a long corridor um and and i got dragged in for interrogation first down now i know all about a couple i've just done northern ireland so you know just give them a bit of bullshit and and hopefully they'll they'll ignore me so i i told the truth i've only been there two weeks uh, but the slight lie that i gave them was i'm just a driver i know nothing yeah um and and i just that that, I, that was my plan uh, can i can so i pause, can I pause to... you there for a sec mick and I, we're going to carry that on but up the, the bit that I really want to get for the listeners with your story to this point, you and Billy are at gunpoint in the back of this vehicle. You're 45 minute drive from where you're supposed to be. Now they're putting you into the the bin and interrogating you properly. What what are you guys thinking about the, at this stage? What's in your headspace? Are you are you chilled? Are you happy? You're not in, in the shit yet. How how bad? How dire does it sound in your own head? Yeah, we we knew we were in the shit, um, and you, you understood that. Uh, but because of the nature of what we we were doing in in Bosnia, what we do, to be quite frank, I'm surprised more people hadn't been captured, or more people haven't been shot. We only lost one person shot dead in the in the whole time that we. Bear in mind the stuff that we were because um, you know we were the in, intelligence gatherers yep. for the general that was sat in. So it didn't come as a surprise that all of a sudden, yeah, you know, we're captured. So, so you, you just went with it. You know, it was, it was, yeah, you know, they're the risks that you take, really. Right. And there Thank was you. No, yeah, there was no panic, and there was no, you know, because you know, if they think we're UN, which they should do, um, the chances of them shooting us are pretty remote, to be honest. Right. They're, they're not really going to benefit. So. So that's going through my mind. So, but to be honest, for me, you know, it, I didn't think it was a major drama. It, it was an issue. Um, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's a bit of a pain in the ass getting captured. Uh, <laughs> but but certainly, you know, I, I, I certainly didn't think that my life was at risk here. And that's and that's how I, how I approached it, I suppose. But I think doing undercover in Northern Ireland probably helped uh, because you is of um, uh, you know slightly different level, if that makes sense. Because if you get yeah. captured over there, boy, you are you in trouble? Yeah, um, gosh. So, so yeah, so so on that really. So so they had to get more out of me, um, and and they got nothing, and they yep. got a bit pissed off actually. <laughs> so they chucked me in the corridor, and the individual that I said was a bit pissed off because me and Billy laughed at him. They he took great delight really in in every now and then kicking. In the, in the ribs with his with his weapon and and stuff like that. Oh. Not what you would expect when you get captured. You know what I mean? Nothing, but certainly nothing untoward and nothing above and beyond. You know, getting a bit of a tickle around the ribs and stuff like that. Um, Billy got dragged in. Um, tried to speak Serbo Croat. Big mistake, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. Um, so he he went. He was in there for about an hour. Got chucked out. Um, Dragged back in, and and he got dragged in about four or five times. Um, I, I was chuffed a bit. <laughs> uh, but they put two and two together. Um, you know, Mister 
Prudor, who's a driver who knows nothing, what a waste of space he is. So let's forget him. Let's concentrate now on the individual that's, that knows a bit of servo cryout. So must be the must be the intelligent one. <laughs> um, and, that, and that was and that and that was their mindset. Um, anyway, eventually, me and Billy got put slightly together, uh, closer. So we managed to whisper to each other. Uh, and Billy leant across and said, "Flipping hell, mate! What did you tell him?" And I said, "Sorry, mate, but I just told him I'm a driver." Uh, <laughs> Billy's response was, "Yeah, but I'm the driver." <laughs> <laughs> Do as you lose, uh, if that makes sense. But I did say to Billy, listen, it's probably because you you talk too much and that and that's why you you're being dragged in all the time, uh, if that makes sense. So at the end of that, what the two other lads that were back uh, with the meeting, they realized that we were now missing. So the general uh, in Sarajevo said, listen, no dramas, fantastic SAS attitude, no dramas, go straight into the meeting now annoy Paul uh, and arrest the Serb general and tell him if he doesn't get uh, Mick and Billy released, he's going to end up back in Bihach, uh, which is a, a staunch uh, Muslim enclave. Thought of a Serb general going back there, he, he obviously pooped his pants, was on his sat phone straight away and got us released. So two hours later, uh, we ended up, you know, back where we were, you know, so on the way back, um, we we didn't make a drama out of it. it. It wasn't, you know, yes, it was a pain in the backside and some of we can talk to the, the kids about when we're older, but we didn't, we just didn't class it as a major drama, uh, if, if that makes sense, you know, and, and I think it may be that, that mentality was slightly different because I, I spoke about it to my kids. Uh, who were all in the military, and and they say, "Been old, Dad." <laughs> that, that's actually quite a big thing, like you know. But for us, it was you know, you know, no drama. So the only people that knew him were the other two people in the patrol, uh, and uh, the general in Sarajevo, and also the squadron commander. He, he obviously, and maybe one or two other people. So when Billy uh, got out uh, and started doing who days on TV. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, a program where he first mentioned about captured uh, in Bosnia. And uh, what Billy said was he got loads of people ringing him up, ex B squadron, saying, Flipping hell, Billy, that's a bit of a bullshit story. You've never <laughs> been captured. And he went, Actually, <laughs> we have. Um, we just didn't. We just didn't make a song and dance about it, mate. Uh, that makes sense. You know, it was it was one of them things that you expect to happen at some stage because of what the work you were doing. Yeah. Um, how we lost only one person really in Bosnia uh, was was quite amazing because we were doing a lot of ballsy operations uh, because you had to be. Um, and it's a, a bit like we're operating in Northern Ireland. You can operate in Northern Ireland quite safely but you need a big set of balls uh, to do it and uh, as long as you can have that way of going about it you know it, it you know things are are achievable uh you know by by just being a bit a bit more balls uh so uh, yeah for us it was you know not a drama it, it, it happened a bit of a pain in the back of the day really you know sat in the company of serbs uh, trying to get but we actually got more intelligence out of them uh, than what they, you know, Mr. Driver Thicky. Uh, but the good thing was, is we noticed all the all their uh, weapon and, and um, vehicle movement and and what was on this road that was going to from Sanski Most to Priador. So we got a lot. Of I think your um your attitude there sums this this whole show up perfectly. You know, because the majority of this was around self protection, situation awareness. And most of the general public that are not in, into into this sort of thing, they think your special forces guys go around beating the chest. And and the simple fact is we don't because you wouldn't get in if, uh, and you wouldn't survive if you were in, uh, if you did. And that's what this is about. E I, I've got a term, I don't think I invented it, but I use it. Um, ego will get you killed. 
you know, um, we, we don't go in like that. If you can get away, get away. You're, you're a moron if you're walking into a fight because you don't know what they got, who who they've got hanging around the, the corner, what's going on. And your attitude there, Mick, you know, captured a gunpoint, both of you, and you just, you're just not beating your chest and you're not overreacting, not underreacting either, and just being situation aware. Uh, as you said, you were so situation aware, you're actually seeing what the hell um, their intelligence was and their movements so you could actually still do your job. And that's having the bandwidth. I think really that story sums this up why you're, you're going to be successful and why you're, you're doing what you're doing and also why Special Forces guys are, are the people that are the best at helping the general public out with their skills and knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I think what you're doing is is great as well uh, on that side. So it's nice to see that uh, we've got the globe covered. <laughs> I was doing it up, up here uh, and you lot doing it. Because, uh, you know, when you think about it, um, we have got a lot of skills between us to 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 help people out. Um, and it's funny, we, we were on a, an anti-terrorist uh, uh, exercise in London. Um, we had all the equipment to, to break into places. And the sergeant major at the time said, do you realise we've got the the skills here uh, to break into any major bank and get away with it? And and he's right. The skill set that, that SF people have, special forces individuals have got, would surprise even even the worst people uh, what you what you know and what you can do, like, you know. So it's fine. We were taught um, that we're the ones, us being the men in black, um, were the ones that Prime Minister calls when she wants to call the emergency services, and same with Maggie Thatcher, she literally called you, called you guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. Hey, look, um, Mick, at the start of the show, I do that. I narrate the show notes, so right at the start, they know everything uh, they know to get in contact with you. But for the listeners and viewers now, what's the best place to find out more about you and what you're doing uh, with Keeley, and what's the best place to connect with with you online? Yeah, so we're we're on we're big on LinkedIn. Uh, we're very very vocal on LinkedIn because that that's because there's a lot of our peer sort of people on there. Uh, but also our website uh, www.hawksandco uh, all spelled a n d c o uh, dot dot uk uh, if that makes sense. And um, any anything that we um, if if you don't ask, you don't get. If that makes sense, uh, we're not here to to make money. It's nice to be paid, uh, but, you know, for us, it's all about helping people. Beautiful. It's so true, and it's. I'm stunned. I, I interviewed the All Blacks uh, coach, Steve Hansen, the other day. He said the same thing. Uh, the guests on the show, I'm humbled. I do interview the best people in the world at what they do. I never say that lightly. And for some reason, we they all say the same thing, that we're there to help others. So if one person has heard one thing on this show that's helped them, I think I'd like to think we've done our job. Brilliant. Look, it was an absolute honour to have you on, uh, Mick. Um, I'll hit pause over chat, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Uh, Absolutely loved it, mate. And uh, th thanks for the invite. Much appreciated. You're very welcome. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former New Zealand Special Forces operator and former Australian police officer and your podcast host. Please check out my new project at hownottodieguy.com where I teach everything you need to know to both males and females, at-risk populations, schools, kids and the elderly, for self-defence, situation awareness and all-round skills that every good person should know. Thanks for watching.